Well, good morning, everyone. It's really great seeing you, and uh, thank you, Shelly and Bruce and uh, Jada and Tripp for uh, the worship this morning. That was uh, just an awesome, good, good, good time there. We've been talking for the uh, past few weeks, uh, and we're concluding the series that we've been doing called Faith That Follows. And if you're new in your walk with the Lord, that's great. You know, you, uh, you just relax a little bit. But I, w- I want to challenge those that, or maybe you're just exploring a relationship with the Lord. And that's, that's fine, too. And we, we love that. We love when people are doing that. But for those of us who have maybe walked with the Lord for a while, then there's this challenge to be growing in our life. And uh, I, I hope that you, if you've been in a relationship with God for a while, that you're ready to move beyond the shallowness that often passes for Christianity, uh, the shallowness that says, I'm in this for me, because that's where a lot of people are in their relationship with Christ. I'm in it to be happy. I'm in it to be blessed. I'm in it to see exciting things. I'm in it for God to do pretty much whatever I would like him to do. And if he does that, then I'm, I'm good. And if it doesn't work out my way, then I'll look for another God that uh, won't have demands on me or... Uh, you know, or whatever, or give me whatever I want. But we've been talking about a faith that's deeper than that, a faith that follows God, follows wherever He leads us, whatever the cost, even when it's inconvenient, and especially those times when I don't always understand, because there are those times in our Christian life that we just don't understand, right? Okay? But it's this mentality that says, the Lord is my God, and I will follow Him. So we've been talking about Abraham, and this is just a, a great example for us in our Christian life, Uh, and there are things that he went through and things that uh, are recorded for us. They're not just like, here's just some history. These things are recorded for us so that we can learn and we can grow. So we've been talking over the past few weeks. Here's some of the things that we've learned, just a quick little review here. First of all, we've said, let God be the leader in your life. Don't you Try to be the leader and ask God to be your co-pilot. You ask him to be the pilot. You let him lead. You follow, okay? The second thing that we talked about, don't pull up short of God's destination for you. This is like a little thing that happened in in Abraham's life where he went part of the way and then he kind of settled in, but he didn't go the full way until... He, he made that transition a little bit later and then, but okay, I'm going all the way. Sometimes in our life, we can kind of start out on a journey with God, and then we pull up a little bit short, and we go, this is, seems like a comfortable place. I think I'll just park myself right here for a while. And we can, when we do that, it's easy to miss out on exactly what God has destined for us and his purpose for us. So don't do that. Keep pressing all the way in your relationship with God. The third thing we learned, following God doesn't mean things are always easy right? <laughs> um, sometimes there are some obstacles. Sometimes there are some pretty intense challenges. And so we learn to trust him and work through those things. Uh, fourth thing that we talked about, conflict. Conflict in relationships. And we said that conflict is inevitable. But we have a responsibility as Christian believers to resolve it as quickly and graciously as possible. That doesn't always mean you get to win, <laughs> Okay, some of the some of the things we say and think is like, yeah, I'll I'll resolve the conflict. You just do it my way, and then uh, we won't have any conflict. No, there's sometimes there's a giving of ourselves, a humbling ourselves, and you saw that in Abraham when he said to Lot, "You choose whatever you want, and I'll take what's left over." That's a pretty amazing perspective, isn't it? So that's gracious, and so we want to have that, that kind of heart in in us also. Uh, Number five, we said we must take possession of God's promises. Uh, He's made these wonderful promises to us, but if you just kind of leave them there, it's like uh, leave money on the table, okay? Pick it up, put it into your account, live it, take possession of his promises. And uh, then we also talked to the sixth thing, as followers of Jesus, we're always going to experience spiritual conflict in our life. And that may have been a new thought to some of you, but that's just the way it is. There is spiritual conflict that we will go through where the enemy of our souls, uh, he's trying to rip things from us and keep us from moving into that place of uh, total abundance 
and in our relationship with Jesus where we're just living for him, we're excited about him, and he's truly the Lord of our life. And so all this kind of stuff is going on. So we have to arm ourselves with spiritual weapons. We talked about that. And we have to pray for an effective battle strategy. And we have worship as a part of our uh, overcoming spiritual conflict. It's very, very important. A lot of people think when we sing our songs or whatever, those are just a few little songs. Uh, and we're just kind of doing some filler until a message or whatever. No, 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 no. This is a time when we come into the presence of God and we say, you are God. I'm making the declaration, okay? You are God. I'm making it to myself. I'm making it to you, Lord. I'm making it to everybody else. I worship you. I, I trust in you. Uh, you're a good, good father. That's who you are. That's what we were singing today. This is a song that I think, is a, a great song for us in our church family here that we just get that and it's into our spirit that those times when we don't understand what's going on in life, we can just remember he's a good, good father. He's perfect in all of his ways. So just a, a wonderful thing. And finally, uh, last week we talked about following God sometimes involves these different seasons and sometimes we walk into a season of darkness in our spiritual life and that blows a lot of people away. It's like, I can't see. I don't know what God is doing. It just seems like everything is dark, and I don't know if he's hearing me right now. You ever had that kind of a thing, and it could be pretty shocking to a lot of people? Like, nobody told me that this could happen. Well, it does happen. There's sometimes seasons of darkness where you feel like when you pray, it doesn't really, you know, does God get it? Is it just sticking to the ceiling and, and hanging right there and looking back at me? Well, there are seasons of darkness, and that's okay. But here's the thing we talked about, so important. God never loses track of us. You, you may think that he's shrouded in darkness, but you're not shrouded in darkness to him. He sees you clearly. He doesn't get uh, confused and distracted by other things and lose track of who you are and what you're doing, and then like, oh, oh, I forgot about you. Let me hurry up and try to fix things up in your life. No. He sees you and he knows exactly everything that's happening in you. It's all under control. That's such a good, good thought for us. He never loses track. And he will show us his faithfulness, just as he did for Abraham. And he took him out and he said, look at all the stars in the sky. Abraham was a dark night and there wasn't all the distraction of city lights and everything. It's like a multitude of stars. And he said, that's what I'm going to do for you. And Abraham had to make a choice in that moment in the darkness of his uh, disappointment that he didn't have any children. God said, no, I'm going to do a miracle in your life. You are going to have a son. You're going to have offspring that's just like this amount of stars. You won't even be able to count them. And it seemed like an impossible situation to Abraham because he's old. And it says, the Bible says he chose to believe. That's what we have to do. Each of us has to choose to believe. God will show you his faithfulness, but we have to choose to believe. And finally, we said we have to drive away the vultures in our life. And Abraham was doing the sacrifice thing for the Lord, and he's chasing away these vultures that are trying to pick at it. And in our life, uh, this represents the enemy trying to uh, take away our sacrifice to God get us distracted from that, and pick away the things that God is wanting to do in your life. And we just have to chase that away and say, you know what? No, no, uh, this is for God. My life is for God. Nothing else is going to consume that. And uh, I'm chasing away those things that would distract me from him, okay? So that's a little bit of a review. We're ready to launch in what we want to look at today. And I want to uh, put this scripture up here. This is Genesis chapter 21, verse 1 through 3. Then the Lord did exactly what he had promised. Don't let that be a surprise to you, by the way, because the Lord will always do exactly what he promises. So he does that. And Sarah, this is Abraham's wife, she became pregnant and she gave a son to Abraham in his old age. It all happened at the time that God had said it would. And Abraham named his son Isaac. Now you remember God had promised Abraham he would have numerous uncountable offspring and yet it's late in his life. He doesn't have any children. And Abraham did um, what we all tend to do sometimes, and that is we try to make something happen ourselves. You ever done that? It's like, I don't see God coming through on this. I'm going to try to manipulate this circumstance, and I'm going to try to make something happen 
to help God out because he probably needs my help on this just a little bit. That's what Abraham did. And so what he does is he actually takes uh, Sarah's, she has a handmaiden, and Sarah says, it doesn't seem like I'm having any children. Why don't you just, you know, try to make a family with her? And Abraham said, okay, <laughs> sounds fun to me. And, and so he does that, and he does have a son, okay? But God says, uh-uh-uh, that's not, that's not what my promise was. That's a, a manipulation of your own, okay? And that's the whole, if you get, read Galatians, that's what it's talking about. It talks about the flesh versus the spirit. That's what this is. Ishmael represents the, the role of my efforts. And Isaac represents God's grace and his provision and his miracle. This is what we face in when we get into the whole realm of religion. A lot of people are like, religion to me means I try to do things to make God respond to me, to make him love me or bless me or bring salvation or earn my way to heaven. It's all this work of the flesh that we do. And God says, that's not the way it works. It's going to be a work of the spirit. It's going to be a miracle. It's my gift to you. And that's, that's what the life of Isaac is all about. God's provision, God's gift, and not the efforts of human it's trying to make something happen there. So there's a deep, deep spiritual lesson in that. Okay, now here's where I want to get to do today. This is in the 22nd chapter, and this is kind of mind-blowing because we read in verse 1, Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he'd cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and he saw the place in the distance. And he said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife as the two of them went on together. Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. And when they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there, and he arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you've not withheld from me your son, your only son. And Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. And he went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Kind of a weird story, isn't it? I mean, he's like, what in the world is going on here? This is like, makes me uncomfortable, right? It's like, ah, I think this will make some more sense to you as we kind of churn through this just a little bit. I want to say that this, I think, is the crowning moment of Abraham's life. It isn't... Uh, wasn't the three times that God appeared to him. It wasn't the big military victory that he experienced. It wasn't all the material blessings that he was given. It wasn't even the birth of his son. It was this event, this incredible trust in God and complete surrender to him. Absolutely mind-blowing, and that's his high point. Now, as we journey on our spiritual walk and our pilgrimage, we have a lot of similarities to Abraham, trusting 
following day after day after day. We make mistakes just like Abraham did. And we talked about some of those. We don't always see clearly like Abraham didn't always see clearly, but we press forward. We roll out of bed every morning. We don't know exactly what the day's going to hold for us, right? And just as Abraham needed a miracle for Isaac to be born, we need the miracle of God's life in us for us to live for him. We, we can't do it ourselves. And here's the thing. Growth is a process. It's a process. Uh, some of you, any of you do gardening or anything like that? Okay. You, you know that, man, it's, there's a process. There's, there's some effort involved in this whole thing. It doesn't just happen. Now, weeds, they don't take any effort. They just show up, right? It's like, what? Where'd you come from? You weren't even here yesterday, and there you are. You're like tall already. Uh, and so w- it's like weeds come easy, but, but the things that you really want, that's process. And it's often a slow process, spiritual growth. Abraham's gone through a growth process in his life. And God's goal is being realized in him. By the way, just in case you didn't know this, God has a goal for your life. He has a goal for your life. He has a goal for your life. And uh, what is that goal? Is it that you would walk on water or uh, have little tinglies in your fingers and, and everyone you touch gets healed? Uh, I used, you might think, well, what a crazy thing to say. But that's kind of how I started you know, my Christian life. It's like, I, I think that's what I, my goal is. And I, I think that would be God's goal for me, right? No, that isn't God's goal for you. It wasn't God's goal for me. Here's God's goal for you and me both. This is very significant because once we understand what his goal is, everything that he's doing in our lives will make so much more sense. So here it is. We'll put it on the screen. To trust him completely and to live in surrender to his direction and his call. And just, just leave, Patrick, leave that up there for a while, <laughs> okay? Because this is something that needs to get inside of us. And it's just like, when you get this, then life makes sense. And the challenges make sense. Because, ah, this is what God is up to. Because sometimes we're like, what is God doing? And this is what he's doing. His goal is that we would trust him completely and live in surrender to his direction and call. The desire of God's heart is to bring us to a place where we never again doubt his character and his nature. That's kind of the first place we go to sometimes. I don't know if I can really trust God. That doesn't make any sense to me. God wants to bring us to this place like, you know what, even the things that don't make sense to me, I don't distrust who he is and what he said and his character and his nature. He's he's good. He's good. I know that. So even when my circumstances are lousy, he's good. So I know he's up to something good for me. He's promised that. Remember I said we had to take possession of the promises? He's promised that all things work together for good to those that love him and are called according to his purpose. That's you. You're called according to his purpose. And so he's at work doing good things inside of you. So we don't want to doubt his character and his nature. We want to be in this place where we trust and continue following even when we can't see clearly ourselves. Remember, he doesn't ever have that problem. He always sees clearly, but sometimes we don't. It's a place where we come to know God's word will never fail us and that his presence will never, ever leave us. That's the place. And he wants us to have this total readiness to do whatever he has for us to do, and that's total surrender. Now, that's quite a process, isn't it? It's like, like, whoa, I don't know if I'll ever get there. But that's the thing that God is at work doing in our life. And sometimes we intend to have that kind of heart, right? It's like, oh, okay, I'm going to surrender to him, and I'm going to have that heart for him. But, you know, it's easy to have that intention in our life, but sometimes we start with that, and then we kind of back off of that a little bit. I'm going to surrender to you, God. You're going to be the Lord of my life. And then the next morning we wake up, it's like, God, just step aside. I got this. I'll call the shots. Watch this little video. 
Jesus, I have decided to give you this. Really? Yeah. You know whoever sits here makes all the decisions, right? I know, and I'm always making decisions, but you make the perfect decisions, so you just sit right down and start making them. Wow, I'm honored. I mean, this feels great. <laughs> Kathleen, guess what? I just got my new credit card. It's time to go shopping. <laughs> oh, really? I thought your husband and you were going to pay off debt. Oh, yeah. I mean, money's kind of tight, but I figured he doesn't have to know about it. So do you want to oh. go with me? No. <laughs> no? Why? Uh, what I mean is, uh, I don't know. Um, oh. So let me check my schedule, and then I'll get back to you. Okay, yeah, give me a call. Okay. <laughs> Kat, what's going on? What do you mean? Well, I'm kind of one cheek in it here. Look, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. You wanted me to sit here, right? Well, of course. And whoever sits here makes all the decisions? Right. So what's the problem? Uh, there's not a problem. I just, I don't know what I was thinking. Really, please, here, sit down. As long as you're sure. I'm sure. Okay, okay. so let's start over. Okay. All right. Kat, I noticed that you've been losing your temper a lot lately. Right. So, okay, Jesus, you know what? I know what you're going to say, but um, see, you, do? you don't know the whole situation, you know? Oh, I, well, all I'm saying is that your attitude is a decision. Yes, of course, but I have a lot going on right now. And... Well, I know you're under a lot of pressure. Pressure? Jesus, you don't understand pressure, okay? This I... isn't working, Kat. What? We can't both sit on the seat. It's either me or it's you. Okay, I know. You know, I just, I didn't think it was going to be this hard, but here, just take it. No, I'm not going to take it. You have to give it to me. Okay, here. Kathleen, make a choice. I can't. You just did. Uh, it's hard for us. And we may initiate it, but we want that stool back. Or we want to share it. But real surrender says, Jesus, this is, this is for you. And this is process. Okay, it's process for us. But it needs to be a kind of an everyday decision that we're making. Here's Abraham. He hears the voice of the Lord calling his name. Abraham recognizes the voice, says, here I am. And here's this thing that doesn't make any sense. Take your son, the one you love, the one you prayed for all your life, the promise that didn't seem like it was ever going to be fulfilled. That promise that you now have, I want you to give it up and lay it on the altar. An altar is a place where we meet with God, okay? Now, I bet some, there's some things in your life you consider pretty precious. Maybe your reputation or your career or your spouse, your kids, your health, your hobby, your attitude about something or some dream that you have. I want to ask you today, could you trust God enough that if he would say, I want you to uncurl your fingers from clutching that so tightly and give that to me, could you do it? Because this is what's going on with Abraham here. Not talking about the thing that you feel casual about. The thing that's most important to you. That's intense, isn't it? I'm sure this hit Abraham as hard as it hits you. What? Offer my son on some kind of a sacrifice? It seems so out of place, so out of character for, for God. And by the way, let me just say this very clearly. God has never and never wanted anyone to participate in human sacrifice. It never happened with God's people. God never expected it. He never wanted it. Uh, he, that's always been abhorrent to him. The pagans did that in the land that they lived in. So this didn't really in, uh, add up in the sense that this was a promised child, it was a miracle child, and it appeared on the surface that God is asking for something that would change his character and who he is, but that's not the case at all, what, what's going on here. God has no intention of Abraham going through with this. He's just bringing him to this place of complete surrender so that the thing that God has given doesn't take the place of God. The things that God gives us aren't to be clutched tightly to so that we say, God, you just step aside because this now has become my God. 
God says, that's not the way it works. I am to be your God. And all the things, all the blessings, all the things that uh, he gives to us, those are to be held loosely and in an attitude of surrender to him. And so that's what we're seeing displayed in Abraham's response here. He gets up, it says, early the next morning. I would have said, let me just take a little time to think about this. But he gets up early the next morning and sets out on this journey. And that's just trust. That's faith that follows. When we can walk with God and listen to God and obey God, even when it doesn't make sense to us. And uh, I, I love this scripture, and I've referred to it before, and I'll probably do it uh, again a few times. But it's Isaiah 55, 8. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my, your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. That's something to always remember because we, we want to kind of evaluate God based on our thoughts and values and everything. And God says, man, I'm so, I'm way above you. Way above. Thoughts are wiser and higher and, and so you just got to understand this. Now there's a couple of things that undergird Abraham's faith here and I, this will help explain why he was able to have this faith. Back in the previous chapter, God had said it was going to be through Isaac that the promise would be fulfilled. So God speaks this. It's happening through Isaac, he said, and God had promised descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And Abraham believed God. So he already knew and he believed that whatever was going to happen here had no lasting effect because God was going to do this miracle through Isaac. So here's, here's how you see this manifest. When they've been traveling with the servants for a couple of days and they get close to this spot and Abraham says something very telling to his other servants. He says, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We're going to worship. And then he says, and then we will come back to you. Not I'll be back, <laughs> but he said, we're coming back to you. So here's what the writer of the Hebrews says about this. This is 2,200 years later. He says, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it's through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. What's that mean? Well, God has said there's some uh, things that you're not going to understand here, but you, you just want it, you need to trust me. And Abraham says, I will trust you even though I don't understand it, and I'm going to believe that you're going to do what you have promised to do even though uh, I don't know how that can happen. And so he, in his mind, it's, he's surrendered. And he lays Isaac on the altar. God says, that's not what's happening here. But the heart is what I'm looking for. And that's what Abraham had. He's a wonderful illustration of a surrendered life. And I think we can learn so much from him that we can attain to surrender in our Christian lives too. By the way, quick uh, response to results of Abraham's faith that follows. He received all the promises that God had made. Pretty amazing. He learned God's heart. And he became an instrument of God's blessing to multitudes, to the whole world. So pretty big payoff in this whole thing. So remember that. Now we're going to transition into a time of communion this morning, but I, I want to just say there's something very important in this story of Abraham and Isaac I wanted to mention to you. Isaac uh, asked on the way up the mountain, hey dad, I'm seeing the wood and the fire, but uh, I think we're missing something here. I think we're missing the actual sacrifice. I don't see a lamb. And Abraham made this statement. He said, God himself will provide a lamb. Those words were not only prophetic for that day, but they're prophetic for Jesus, who took away the sins of the world. God provided the sacrifice for all of our sins. It was John the Baptist who made the proclamation when he saw Jesus. Behold the what? What did he say? Behold the, the lamb of God. Okay, he made that proclamation. The Lamb of God, and he went on to say, who takes away the sins of the world? The Lamb was provided by God himself. This event, by the way, takes place at a, 
place called Moriah we read in Scripture there. Many people believe this is the same hilly range Moriah that's mentioned in Second Chronicles as the place that David purchased to build the temple, which puts this essentially on the same spot that Jesus was crucified, died on the cross for us. Isn't that amazing? That's just pretty cool. So uh, anyway, just, just a great thought. But here's the thing. God does not ask you and I to surrender in order to coax him into doing something for us, coax him into loving us more or blessing us more or giving us salvation. He doesn't ask us to surrender to coax him into anything. But surrender is always a response to what God has done. That's where we need to live on this. So when we talk about surrender, it's not so, I'm going to do that so that. No, we're going to surrender because. Because of the cross. Because of his love for you. Because of his sacrifice for you. And because of that, we can say, Lord, you're a good, good father, and I can surrender my life to you. I can surrender my will to you. I can let you sit on that throne, that stool, as the Lord of my life without me pushing you off all the time. And when you say, you need to change this attitude, you need to love these people that you don't normally want to love, okay, Lord, I surrender. I follow you. That's what we want to do.